I'm on. It's my fault. Uh, you could be anywhere, but you're here with us, and I highly, highly appreciate that. Us as a church, as us as leaders here, us just as family, we love for all of us to be together. And hopefully you had a great week, uh, Labor Day week. You got to spend that, that Monday just enjoying it the day off, and then Tuesday happened, and everybody's back in school, which was even better than Monday. What a glorious day uh, to our household budget, because it's cheaper when they're in school. Uh, so uh, hopefully your first week of school went great for the teachers and the, the staff. I know this school was had some things going on. The gym's not done, and so the, where the sixth graders and seventh graders are going to go, and the eighth graders, so they had to figure that out. And then all the new parents who have, to, who have to understand what the car line is, you know, all the new kindergartners' parents, they're like, oh, I don't understand a car line. Like, hope you had patience with them like I did. That's why I get there early, so I don't have to deal with all that foolishness back behind me because people getting out of car... Car line's a big deal, y'all. Y'all understand. It's stressful. It can be stressful. So hopefully you had a good week and you're ready to make this week uh, even better because the Lord is with you. And we are in the second part of our series, as Jason said, entitled First Things First. We are need to know what we are to do, what priority we need to place things, how God has designed us to operate and how he's called us to love him and to love each other. And there are priorities and how God has laid us out to live, to be, uh, to think, to to be in fellowship, and sometimes those things get out of whack. They get out of order. So we was like, man, it's, if we're getting a start, restart, as September is our second start of the year, January is our first start, and September is our second start because we follow the school calendar for most of our lives, we, we need to refocus. We need to replan. We need to re-energize. We need to get back on the same page of, God, what's the first things first? What should we be doing? And so last week we talked about First, we need to seek king, the kingdom of God because he says that that is the most important thing. Not to worry, not to doubt, not to, have, not to have little faith or no faith at all. The first thing, the most important thing you can do in your life is to seek my kingdom. That is what you designed to do. And now, how do we do that? The next three weeks is how we actually are to seek his kingdom first. How are we actually going to do this thing of putting God's priorities as our priorities? And so we're going to look at a, spe a specific part of seeking God's first. And I read this study done by George Barna Institute, and it says this as it contains or concerns worship. It says half of all church-going adults say they did not experience God's presence last year. Half of all church-going adults, so that would be us, not just those who check bark, Christ, check bark Christians, but like those who say, I am a follower of Christ, I go to church, I, I am pursuing Christ, say that they, half of them said they did not experience God at all last year. Two-thirds of all church-going adults cannot describe what worship is, because most of them consider worship to be a Sunday morning event. Most Christians consider worship to be a secondary priority is really not the most important thing. A lot of church-going Christians, adults, would say they can do without worship in their service. And there is some um, definition. There's some things we need to clarify if we're going to put the first things first and understand what God has us to do when it comes to worship, and it's beyond the three curtains we have here. It's beyond the four walls that we have here. It's beyond calling yourself a church to understand what worship is and saying that is the first thing you need to, to do. So the question is, why do you come to worship service? Why are you here today? What brings you here today? It might, it might be, in my head, marriage is what brings us here today. Like, what brings you here today? What did you expect when you came here? For many of you, you come to church because it's a time of spiritual refreshment. You come to re-energize yourself. You come to gain some strength and to be in the presence of God with other believers so you can be ready to go out for another work week into the world or into your school, whatever it may be. Some of you come to church out of a sense of duty. You're like, I signed up a while ago for something I didn't know what I signed up for, and now I'm stuck. So I'm here because I have to do my volunteering duty because I'm a man or a woman of my word. So some of you are here out of duty. Some of you are here because it's just part of what you're weak. Like Sunday, I go to church. That's what I've done my whole life. And if I don't go to church, I don't feel right. So I come out of this obligation I have to myself and calendar, like in my rhythm, I come to church. Some of you come because you have this sense 
of community that you want to belong to, being a part of something bigger and better than yourself. Like you appreciate being a part of something that is doing awesome things and, and are coming to a place where you feel accepted. We say here at Bowie City Church that it's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. So if you show up today and you say, I'm not okay, good. That's, that's, that's good because I had some not okay moments this week too. It's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. And so you come because you, you want to be a part of that and belong to something like that. But some of you, you come for a less noble reason. Some of you come because your life is a mess. Your life is upside down. And you're like, man, if I come to church, maybe that'll make it better. Maybe I can get some brownie points with God. And some of you, you're, you're just solely here because your mama and dad made you come. Some of you are here because your spouse made you come. Some of you are here because you just have to come because so-and-so said so. And all these reasons have some merit on their own, but none of them should be the reason why you come to church. None of them should be the reason why you come to a worship service. So a church, what we call ourselves booty, boo, booty. What do you call yourself? <laughs> Booey City Church. That's a different kind of church. <laughs> booty Church is a different church. If you come to Booey City Church... That is just a name of a group of people. That is what it is. This is what we as a church call ourselves. We are a gathering, basically, of sheep. And Christ is our lead shepherd. And so this group that we call ourselves is Bowie City Church. Great. Awesome. But that is not what you're coming to. You're not coming to church. That's a Western term. That's what we say. Are you coming to church? Well, that's... we. Some of us understand what that means, and some of us don't. Like, they, understand, they say, yeah, I'm coming to church because this is what church is. Not quite. You're coming to a worship service that Bowie City Church is ha- having. A worship service. So if you come to a worship sh- service, you expect it to do what? Worship. But what does that mean? See, God is calling us. You need to get the first things first, and if you're going to follow me, you need to understand that, and the first thing you have to do is understand that you are to worship me. You are to worship me, and there's a huge difference between attending church and coming to worship. They're two separate things. There are people who've come to church and never worshiped. There are people who worshiped and never came to a church. They're two different things, so we need to Make sure we understand that so we can put the first things first when it comes to worshiping our Lord. We should come here today quite simply to worship because we are worshipers. We are all worshipers. And you're like, Don, I'm not quite. Yes, you are. You are a worshiper. This morning, we're going to revisit a story that's going to hash out what it means to be a worshiper. Because if we're going to get this right, we're going to put this in the right priority, if we're going to seek first the kingdom of God and all the things that will be added unto you, all the things, like the priorities that God's going to make sure you have, all the, the clothes, the resources, the, everything you need, seek me first. Great, I'll seek you first. How am I going to do that? By being a worshiper. Well, what does that mean? We're going to look at a story. And we've preached on this story multiple times in multiple different facets. Today we're going to talk about it in the, in the attitude and look at it and, as worship. So we're going to turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. and John chapter 4, it is about the woman at the well. So you have John 3, you know, John 3, 16. This is where Jesus talks to Nicodemus and being reborn. And before that, John 2 is with Jesus and his ministry being tempted. And John 1, we have Jesus, like John just talking about Jesus showing up on the scene. So John 4 is where Jesus is talking to the woman of the well. And we, I did give you a little background. We've done different sermons on this, so I'm just going to give you just a little synopsis of this so you can understand the context, what's going on. So Jesus is on a journey with his disciples. He has called them. They're with him, and so they're going to a town, and Jesus says, I have to make a detour. He says, you guys go ahead to town. I got somewhere to go. Jesus had a divine appointment. Jesus had to be somewhere. How many times in our lives do we have a divine appointment and we say, mm, maybe not God, I got somewhere else to go. Like, I got to go here. And God's like, no, go over here. And you're like, mm, no, I really got to go over here. And God's like, no, no, no. I need you to go over here because I got somebody for you to meet. Jesus had a divine appointment with this woman, this woman at the well. And this woman at the well, she's coming at the hot, hottest part of the day, 2 o'clock. 
If you're going to go to the well, you're going to go early when it's cool. You're going to go when it's not hot out. But she couldn't go to the well early and cool when the other women would go to the well because she had this bad reputation about her. And I think they just clowned her. These other women that went to the town, uh, the town said, talk, I think they talked about her. I think they were like, oh, here she come. Hide your, hide your husbands because she she's a man stealer. Like she, like they, so she just went at a different time. She went when nobody else would be there, like the hottest like two o'clock of the day. And Jesus says, I need to be there. I have an appointment with this woman at the well. And how many times has God directed your path somewhere for you to run into somebody and you do this? <gasps> like, and you're like, oh, nope, nope, they ain't see me. Like, I'm gonna go around the aisle real quick. Woo! And Jesus is like, uh, I, I needed you to talk to them. I needed you. There's a reason why. Jason has told me since I was 19. Like, God is always up to something. You just need to know what he's up to. Like, what is God saying? What's God doing, Dion? I'm like 19. I'm like, I don't know. Well, you need to pray that. Like, start praying that. I'm like, pizza and messy games and youth group. He's like, cool. But what is he saying to you? What is he saying in this moment? Like, don't avoid it. God, if I see somebody, is this a divine appointment? And God's like, yes. There's no coincidence. Even to pray for them or talk to them or whatever it may be. But don't dodge your divine appointment. So Jesus had this one. He had to keep it. And he's telling this woman all about herself things that he shouldn't know. He just met her. And this is where we pick up the verse. This is where we pick up the story. Jesus is telling all about her business. She's like, oh my gosh. And so she says this in verse 19 and 20. She says, sir, the woman says, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. See, first, worship begins at the response to a living God. At the response of the living, worship begins when you respond to the living God. This is what she did. After Jesus had told her all about her business, she responds to him. See, the first, the woman reacts to Jesus, and we realize that this is not, like, worship is like a real-life kind of deal. It's not some mystical thing that we do before we start our service. It's not this mystical, magical thing we do before we go back into our work week. It's, no, worship is a real thing. And as Jesus talks to this woman, she comes under this deep conviction that she, this is not just uh, her first husband, this is actually her fifth husband. And Jesus is talking to her and cutting right, like he's like slicing and dicing, conviction is going on, not guilt, because guilt comes from from the enemy. Jesus brings conviction, come on somebody, Jesus brings conviction. He brings it to, your, to the light and says, this is what's going on. See this mirror? It's my word. This is my standard, my holiness, and you're not matching up to this. And she's being convicted. And so she tries to redirect the conversation. You ever do that? We, we ever do that? Like last, like last night, my, one of my kids left out the chocolate milk, like left out the chocolate syrup. And my wife's like, who left out the chocolate syrup? And there's only two people. You know, we have two children. So one says they didn't do it. What do you guys the other one said? I didn't do it. Well, it's a mystery then. But the one who did did it, did do it, tried to like redivert, like, so what are we doing? Like, we still going to the store? She's like, uh, did you leave out chocolate milk? I mean, what's leaving out chocolate syrup? Like, honestly, like he's like beating around the bush. He's convicted. Like, you you got caught, you did something wrong. We do that often. Well, she's doing the same thing. She's like, uh, let's talk about worship. Let's talk about like. Oh, you're, you're calling me out, Jesus. Okay, you're calling me out, prophet, but you say we should worship in Jerusalem, but we are to worship on this mountain. You know us Samaritans can't even go to Jerusalem because y'all don't like us, so come on, you're going to talk to me about my own mess? Well, y'all got some mess going. She's like trying to redivert the conversation. She's trying to deflect because she's being convicted. Like, that's natural. We do that as humans. But I think it's also possible that her conviction leads her to realize that she needs to get right with God. I think there's only two responses with that. When you are convicted, it brings you to two places. Either you're going to go, mm, don't want to deal with that right now. Like, I'm, don't even go there. Like, don't, mm, don't. Even. Or you go, oh, God, I need you. Like, I need to get right with you. Like, prophet, help me. You're so right. You're so right. How am I going to get right with God? You I worship on this mountain, and y'all say we got to go into Jerusalem. And you know we can't go. Help me, prophet. Those are the two responses that you're going to have to conviction. Either you're going to not deal with it or you're going to deal with it. You can't teeter-totter. 
Either you're like, I'm not going to even go there with you right now, prophet, because you got this other thing that we can't even go to Jerusalem to worship, or you say, help me. How am I supposed to worship God, get right with God, when I can't even go into Jerusalem? How is your response when you come to the face-to-face with the living God? It should bring you to a place of worship, and I believe that's where she is. It should cause you to want to worship. It says this in Colossians 1.16, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority. All things have been created through him and for him. Simply put, you and I were made, to, made by him and for him. You exist for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that's to reflect back to God his awesome glory. That is why you are created. God's created the heaven, the stars, the moon, this earth, the solar system, the grass, the birds, the crickets, everything to sing his glory, to bring glory to him. And he, all he wants and yearns from us is our worship. The birds have no choice but to sing. The crickets I hear at three and four in the morning have no choice but to sing to God. When you ever ask, like, why are they singing? Why I, I, I sit out sometimes on our back porch, and it'll be quiet. It'll be, it'll be quiet. You hear the crickets, and then it'll be just this one bird that just starts singing. And then it's like a chorus. It's like, and go. And they're all like, I'm like, who, who told you? Start singing. Like, who? How's that even work? Like, why? What? And they all just start chirping away. It's not mating season. Like, there's no, like, hey, come over here, boo. Like, come on. Like, I'm ready. Like, there's none of that going on. It's just singing. And it happens every day. They have no choice. We have a choice. Are you going to worship God? And when you come into, to face to face with the living God, you, it should bring you to worship, just like this woman. See, if you're not worshiping God, you're not really living. I'm going to say that again. If you're not worshiping God, you are not really living. You may be alive. You may have life. You may you may be alive, your heart's beating, and you're, you're, you have air going in and out of your lungs, but you're not living. You need to be worshiping God to actually have life. And Jesus says, when you come to me, I give you life, and I give you abundant life. As we dive more and deeper into this, to understand what it means to get the right place with God, to be first things first, worshiping God, and realize when I come face to face with him, it calls me, it, it beckons me to come and worship him. So first, you have to come to this place. When you come to, to, to face to face with living God, it brings you to a place of worship, to the response of that. But second, worship is not limited to a specific location. It's not limited to one location. Because she says this in verse, or Jesus says this in verse uh, uh, 21. He says, woman. Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Jesus says the time has come when worship will no longer be associated with a place. He has thrown this lady's like whole thing out of whack. Like what? Like y'all said for years we got to go to the city of Jerusalem. We got to go to Jerusalem. And my forefather said we have to worship on this mountain. And now you're saying that it's not going to matter? Like Jesus is messing with her like he is totally undoing what she knows about what it means to worship God. See, if you worship God, if you're limited to worshiping to a specific location, what happens is when you leave that place of worship, when you leave that location, you leave that attitude of worship there, and you just leave it behind. Like, if I can better describe this, how many of you like going to the movies? Me, I like going to movies. I like going once a month or every six weeks, go to movies. And if I go to a movie, usually it's in three categories. Usually it's Disney, top one. And then, and then it's action and then some, like, space fantasy kind of deal. I don't like love stories and comedies. I do that because my wife likes those. But those are the three things I go to movies. And when I go to movies, I go to experience it. I go, go for two hours. I unplug from the world. I go to enjoy it. I have my popcorn. I have my candy, which is raising nets. When I go to the movies, I got my drink. And I'm there, experiences. As soon as the movie over, I leave that movie theater and I leave 
that experience behind. It is done. Too many of us come to church and we come for the experience and then we leave these four curtains, these three curtains and these four walls and we leave the experience. Like leaving your popcorn bucket that's empty at your seat. We leave it. What good is worship if you can leave it? I say, I'm bigger than a moment. I'm bigger than just coming to a location and just discarding it. It's not about a location. And too many of us do that. We say we're coming to worship as if it's just a moment. And it's larger than that. If we're going to get the first things first right, God says, no, 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 it's not just a location. He says worship, the third point is worship is only as valuable as who and what is based on. Worship is only valuable on who and what the worship actually is based on because he goes on and says, you Samaritans worship, in verse 22, what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. What is Jesus saying here? Because at first it sounds like he's throwing shade at her. He's like, y'all worship what y'all don't know, and we worship what we do know, because salvation comes to the Jews. <laughs> How about that? How about them apples? Like, I don't think he's throwing shade. He's trying to get her to understand why she's hung up on worship being in a location and not where, where worship should be is in the heart. Because Jesus says, note, then verse 21, he says, you worship what you do not know. Verse 22, what you do not know. He says, you worship what you do not know, and not you don't worship who? You don't worship who you know. He, see, they know who God is. They know that there's a God in heaven. That is not the issue. That's not the problem. I'm grateful that they already know who God is. It's good that they're worshiping the true God. What is tragic is that they don't know what they are doing. They know it, but they don't know what they're doing. It's, I see this all the time at the gym. I see it all the time. People know that they should be there for whatever reason. Whatever reason that they're there, they know they should be there. For health, the doctor, fitness, competition, whatever, they're, re- they're there. But a lot of people don't know what they're doing. And y'all seen some videos before, like on YouTube or Facebook. You're like, that's not how that machine works. Like, I don't think you're using that properly. They know they should be there, but they don't know what they're doing. That's what Jesus is saying to the Samaritan. You know there's a God, but you don't know what you're doing. See, the Samaritans, they only had the first five books of the Old Testament. The first five books of the Old Testament is called the Law, or it's called the Pentateuch. And it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the five that they have as their Bible. They have as their law. But there's just all these other books that have come from all these other prophets and the history that goes with who God is and who God has rescued and how he's rescued them and saved them and brought them back to himself and he is their salvation and how he's done so many mighty things through the people of Israel and knowing that they are the salvation, that salvation has come through this people. They don't have those books for whatever reason. They don't have them. And so God's, Jesus is saying, you know, because you have the first five laws, like you know about creation, you know about Abraham, you know about Isaac, you know about Jacob, you know about Joseph, you, you know that. But you're missing the other great part of who God is and how you are to worship him. And that so represents what goes on with us in this church, not necessarily this church, but the church in general. It's tragic in our day that so many people worship what they do not know. It's the only worship that's based upon the Bible is true worship. Only worship that's based upon the Bible is true worship. Anything else is false worship. We are Christianity, Jesus Christ, salvation through his resu- death and resurrection is the only truth that only thing that calls us to worship, anything else is false. Anything based upon, that's not based upon the Bible, is false. He's not saying that every Jew here worships is more acceptable than the Samaritans worship. He, Jesus is not saying that. He's not saying like the Jews are better than the Samaritans. Not saying that at all. But what he is saying is that the principles, at least that the Jews have, a more comprehensive knowledge of who God is, and therefore calls them to worship them, worship God the way that they do. The Samaritans don't have that. Even Paul says it in 2 Timothy 1, 2, I know whom I believe. I know who I worship. 
And this is why I respond the way I do. She was, she was missing it. So Jesus takes it and he, re, he, he changes it. He redirects it and says, okay, let's stop talking about you. Let's talk about you as the location of worship. Let's talk about the manner of worship now. He said, let's talk about and the manner, not where, but how. See, not only worship is, is as valuable as who God is and knowing who God is and based upon what the Bible and the law and his word, but the fourth one, worship is about the attitude of the heart. Worship is about the attitude of the heart. John 4, 23 and 24 says this. Yet a time is coming and has come where true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seek. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. See, first Jesus here is saying, before he arrived on the scene, there was some existence, there was some reason why you should argue, you could argue where you are to worship. I, he's like, I, that's true. Before I got here, Samaritan woman at the well, you are right. Like, there, there was a specific location that worship was supposed to happen at the ark, at the temple, at different places. He's like, you're right. But now that I'm here, now I'm on the scene, there's no need for that anymore. All that's thrown out the window. He says, now that I am here, I've put away those old ways. I've put an end to those old ways. When Jesus lived and Jesus' death upon the cross has put to death the old way of worship. And my question to you is, where is God trying to put to death things in your life when it comes to worship? You may have this misconstrued, this idea of how you're supposed to worship. God's like, that's not how you're supposed to worship me. He said, no, this is how I learned to worship. He's like, but that's not true worship. If it's not based upon my word, that's not real worship. And God is trying to teach you and tell you, put to death the old man, put to death the old ways, and worship me in spirit and in truth. But what does that mean, Jesus? Jesus, when I came and his death on the cross, it tore the veil from the temple from the top to the bottom. And at that moment, worship had changed forever. It was no longer about a location. You can worship me anywhere because I am with you. I have conquered death. I have conquered sin. And it beckons you to worship. For now, he says, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. See, Jesus is not saying that there are two things that you must do. He's not saying there are two separate things. He's not saying you should worship me in spirit and worship me in truth. He's not saying they're two different things. He's saying spirit and truth, not two separate. Basically, it's a one complex idea. We must worship in spirit and true, two things go together, create this attitude of worship. It is like peanut butter and jelly. They're like two together. They're not two separate things. When you put the sandwich together, it's now a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's not a in peanut butter and in jelly sandwich. When you are worshiping the Lord, you are worshiping in spirit and truth combined together. To worship must have the heart and it must have the head. It must have, it must have your emotion, and it must have your knowledge. It must have your thoughts, and it must have your soul. It must have both combined, and that is what he's communicating to this woman. He's like, you're missing it. You're missing the whole point. If you notice in verse 24, this is, this is huge. In verse 24, Jesus says that we must worship God. He says we are must, like the Father Worshippers must worship him and in spirit and in truth. That word must, that word there happens three times in the book of John. Three times that word must shows up, and it shows up really close to each other. The first time it shows up is in John 3, 7, where he says you must be born again. It shows up again in John 3, 14, where it says the Son of Man must be lifted. And it says it again in John 4, 24 that the worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. See, these verses set forth this necessity of having a new life. It sets forth this necessity that Jesus must had to die and need to be lifted high. And it sets this necessity that we are to be true worshipers. I find it astonishing that God Almighty, the creator of everything we are and everything we have, 
longs for our worship. He longs for it. We must worship him. See, we are created to worship him. Louis Giglio, who's another pastor, he says it like this. He says, at the end of your trail of having, uh, of your time, at the end of your trail of your energy, the end of the trail of your passions, the end of the trail of your hobbies, the end of the trail of your interests, there's a throne. And on that throne is whatever you have, commu- commu- have ever put together to say, that is what I worship. If God is not at the end of all your time, effort, and energy, then you're not being a true worshiper. You're a false worshiper. Are you worshiping me in spirit and in truth? So how do we apply this? He's like, okay, I got it. Because here's the important thing. When this woman realizes this, when this is so important, when we become true worshipers, it changes everything around you. It changes the atmosphere around you. It changes your words. It empowers your story. So she goes on and tells the town, this woman who is the outcast of her whole town, she goes in and tells her everything about Jesus, and she becomes this true worshiper, and her whole town becomes saved. When you are a true worshiper, things around you change. The atmosphere changes. You change. Your outlook changes. Everything about you changes because I know who God is, and I know him in my heart, and it causes this this emotion to evoke out of me, and it changes. When you're singing empty words, nothing changes. When you're just showing up, nothing changes. When you don't expect to meet God, nothing changes. So how do we apply this? First, we must make We have to make God our center. We have to make him the center of our worship in everything and in every way. Worship, I'm going to tell you something, and and hopefully this doesn't burn too much. Guess what, y'all? Worship is not about you. It's it's not. We we, we feel like it is sometimes. I mean, have you ever left a church service and saying, I was just so blessed by the worship. I was so blessed by the sermon. It was so good. I got so much out of it. Or have you ever left the sermon feeling like so, so grumpy? You're like, what the heck was Pastor Dion talking about today? And the worship, woo, somebody was off key. And then the sound, that was like, mm, like it was a little high, too much trouble, need a little bit more bass. I'm all about that bass. Like, I, I, like you had this whole thing in your head, like, man, worship was horrible. You ever been there where you're like, oh, it was so good. Oh, it was so bad. It was so, man, I could have done without that. Glad that's over. Worship is not about you. Worship is not even about us collectively. Worship is about God and who he is. Yes, there's some benefits to worshiping and corporately worshiping. Yes, there is. We, we get some energy. We feel good. It makes us connect. We belong when everybody's singing together. Like, there's this unity and harmony that happens. You just feel like God is here and showing up. It is awesome, but it's not for us. It is for God. Worship is for God and God alone. So the question should not be, what did I get out of worship? But the question should be, what can I give to God in worship? Not what I can get out of worship, but what can I give to God of worship? So many times we come to God with all our requests and say, God, can you, can you give me this? God, I need this. God, help me. God, help me. How many times you said, God, what can I do for you? God, what can I do for you? What do you need, God? What do you want from me? And he says, all I want from you, Dion, is you to worship me in spirit and in truth. All I want from you, Dion, is to seek my kingdom first. And I will add all these things unto you. All I want from you is to fulfill my will. All I want for you is to to just say, let your kingdom come and your will be done. That is all I want from you, Dion. How many times do we actually ask that? Saying, God, give me, give me, give me. God, I need, I need, I need. He says, no, no, no. Worship me. Worship me. If we understand that, if we understand who God is, this is why the Samaritan woman could not get it right because she didn't have the knowledge. She didn't know this book. This is why we're saying this, this month, we're going to say, read this book. Like, not just read it. Like, get it into you. Like, as, as much into you as you possibly can. This is why it says meditate on it. 
Meditate on it day and night. If you do, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers or the waters that bring forth his fruit in this season. His leaf also shall not wither, but whatever he does will, not, will prosper. If you meditate on this, if you read it, if you just like fall in love with it, it is God's word. Like it is the, the older I get, the more I understand who God is, the more I want it. The more I look, I'm like, oh, I've been like, I got stuff to do. Oh my gosh, I got to go. It's not like, oh, got to read my Bible. Like, how do you think God loves? Like, can you imagine if you wrote a love letter to the person you love, and you're like, oh, they're going to read it, and they're reading it like, oh, got to read this thing again. Oh, my gosh, so many words. Like, I wrote that for you. Like, what? Are you kidding me? Like, I feel like God's like, I wrote this for you. You should love it. You should reread it and reread it and reread it and, and know it. Like, not just memorize it, but know it. Like, ah, oh, it's part of you. That is what God wants for him to be the center of your worship. The second thing, you need to prepare our hearts beforehand. If we're coming to a worship service, this is what this is. We are in a worship service. You're not in a church service. You're in a worship. If you're coming to a worship service, prepare your heart beforehand. It's necessity. We, we all do it. We all physically prepare ourselves physically for the day. Like, we take a bath or we shower, we put on fresh clothes, we put on deodorant, we comb our hair, we brush our teeth, and I tell you, I highly appreciate it. We all do. The person next to you is like, thank you for taking care of yourself. Mom and Dad told you right. Like, we're, we're grateful for that. We do that for everywhere we go. And if you're not, somebody lets you know, especially if they, if they love you. They're like, mm Mm, you ever had that with your kids? They're like, hi, mom, dad. Whoa, woo Hey, buddy, I love you. Bathroom, brush. Good, come back and give me a double hug. Like, we, we want, like, we appreciate that. We take care of ourselves. We prepare ourselves physically for the world. Do we prepare ourselves before we go to worship? Did you know, like, in the Old, time, in the be- the old Testament, everything they had to do to prepare themselves for worship, they had to wash themselves. They had to put on brand new white clothes, clean clothes, like clean, 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 super, super clean. They had to go get a, a sacrifice as clean, no blemish, all these things just to worship God. All this preparation to worship God. And we just roll out of bed like, oh, I guess I'm going to go to church. Like, do I got to take off my pajamas? Like, oh, uh, like, do I got to shower? Do I have to? Prepare yourself. You're about to worship the true God. You expect to meet him. Y'all going on a, on a good date, hot date, husband, wife, or somebody you're trying to like become a husband, wife with? You prepare yourself, right? You're like, okay, okay, I'm going to wear this. If she says this, I'm going to say that. If he says this, then I'm going to say this. Like, you, we, we prepare ourselves, and then we expect them to show up. Do you expect God to show up? Do, like, do you, I don't, I don't like to speak for me. I get up early in the morning. Six days out of the week, I get up most mm, six and a half days. You know, early is relative for some of you, but I get up early. And the first thing, because I first thing I do, I pray. I acknowledge God. I'm telling you, the first thing I do in my mind is like, thank you, God, for waking me up. You're a great God. You're an awesome God. You're holy. I, I pray to Him. And then the second thing to prepare, because I go and to meet God for worship, I get up. I have to physically move. I have to get up out of the bed. Some people, I've talked to people that are like right in my bed, I just have my devotion, I just have my little light, my wife or her husband is asleep, it doesn't, it doesn't bother them. For me, I'll be like, God, I love you. Like, I'll be out. Like, I got to get up. Like, I have to, I physically have to get up. So either I get up, my knees hit the floor, or I get up and I go out to, to the kitchen or go out to the living room or go out on the back porch or go in the backyard and I walk, like, I prepare myself before I open my word. Before I get into my, like, real groove of prayer, before I get into memorizing my scripture, before I start singing a song, I physically have to move. This is what I have to do to prepare. What are you doing to prepare to meet with God? Like, what are you physically doing? You physically do stuff to go to work and prepare for the day for that. Do you prepare for worship? Mm. Second thing, third thing we have to do is listen carefully. Listen carefully to what God is saying through the message. Before I go on that point, there's something I just want to iterate on the last point. I think this is, I think this is key. 
Most of us think when we go to church, we go to church to worship. But it's a better approach to go worshiping to church. I'll say that again. Some of us say we're going to go to church to worship. A better approach is I'm worshiping as I go to church, as I go to this service. Prepare yourself. But the third thing, listen carefully to what God is saying through the message. Y'all, I make no claims to be the best preacher. I'm not even one of my favorite preachers. Like, I, I listen to somebody else. Like, I have my favorite preachers, too. So I take no offense if I'm, like, way down your favorite preacher list. I'm like, good, because I am, too. Like, I, I get it. I may not be the best preacher. I'm working on being the better, best pastor. That's two different things, different sermon. But I tell you this. I work hard every Sunday. Jason works hard for every Sunday for a message, believing God has something to tell you through the message. And it may not look it, if you actually look at my week, you're like, Dion, you didn't write nothing all week. Now you're writing something? I have been toiling and thinking and reading and going, and then I do it all in one shot. I write it down all in one shot. It may take me hours and hours and hours and hours, and sometimes it's like it just flies out in like 30 minutes, and I tell Mal, I'm done with the sermon. She's like, what? Really? We can do something now? Like, what? Because usually it's like, and I'm gone. Like, I'm like writing my sermon. I do this all not for my sake. I do this because I believe God has something to say to you. And he's saying it through me. And he's saying it through Jason, whoever's up here. Because we know the value of preaching, just like the value of worshiping together, like the value of praying together. Like we don't take it lightly. So even if I'm not the best preacher, God, what are you saying? What are you saying to me? What are you saying to us corporately? I'm going to say this until I am dead and gone. What are you saying? What are you doing? What are you saying? And what are you doing? Even when he is, all his dyslexia comes out and he's saying the wrong stuff. And I'm like, what did he just say? And when he said booty church, like, like, what, like God, even though he said that, what are you saying? And what are you doing? Come to worship expecting to get something out of it. And the last thing. Determine, be determined to participate and not spectate. Be determined to participate and not to spectate. I don't care if you don't know the song. I don't care if the song sounds bad. I don't care if you don't know the scripture. I, I don't care. I don't really care about your feelings at that, mo at that moment. What I do care about is you're like, I'm here to worship God. There's been gone to plenty of churches where I'm like, I have never heard that song in my life. But God, those words, God, I've never heard that person sing before. And mm, I got, mm, I'll just turn my ear this way because they're really not. See, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does he says, those who are the best singers sing. And those who can really play some chords play. And those who really have the rhythm only you guys play. He didn't say those who have the ability to get up and speak in front of others, do that. He says, no, no, make a joyful noise. He says, no, 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 praise me with instruments. Now, if you're going to be leading, you should probably know how to lead people in a rhythmic way that the notes match up and the mathematical equation that are supposed to. Like, it just helps. It's less distraction. But if you go back in those little kids' room back there, they're just going at it. And it's, to us, you're like, ooh, ooh, mm, mm, ooh. Like, that don't sound right. That don't sound good. That's bad. But they're like, la. Like, they're just worshiping God. Because they're saying, I am determined to participate and not spectate. I'm asking you, I'm begging you. As God of all creation, who says they must worship me in spirit, spirit and truth, who's looking down, who's longing for your worship, to look at you and says, you are missing the opportunity to worship me. How sad. Because you don't know the song. Because it's off key. Because the sound's bad. Because you had a bad day. Oh, boy. What? I was like, it's time to bring me glory, because that is what you're created to do. Be determined 
to be a participant and not a spectator. Because you know what? You can spectate all you want at home. I'm not telling you to stay at home. But we do it. You can watch church at home. You can go to a ball game. You can watch it on TV. Or you can be a part of it. First things first, church, we must be worshipers and true worshipers and worshipers of spirit and in truth, knowing who God is. And that, that calls you to have this emotional response. You can't have the two without the other. If you're just an emotional response, worship is wrong. Y'all ever seen that? I've seen it. I've seen it. You're like, what is going on here? There's people crying, falling out, and whatever, and they don't know who God is. They have no idea who he is. They're like, well, they run around, so run with them. They're like, well, they're screaming and shouting, so I'm going to scream and shout. Well, like the same things happen at the ball game. Like, the, what's the difference? There's an emotional response at the ball game. There's an emotional response at church. Is there a difference? Oh, you have to know who he is. And by the knowledge of who he is, it, it causes me to worship. It causes this emotional response to come out. This emotional response comes out of the knowledge, and the knowledge just comes out because of the emotional response. Like, it, it comes together. If I can call you and ask you, church, to do anything, it's to love the Lord your God with all you have, all your heart, all your mind, with all your soul, and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And by doing so, you become a true worshiper and in spirit and in truth. And when you do that, it changes the atmosphere. It changes your outlook. It changes your perception and saying, I know how messed up things are. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You give and take away, but I know who you are. Therefore, my response is this emotional thing of God. You're so great. Yes, I got things failing in my body. Yes, my marriage is not where I want to be. My finances are just really tight. My boss is driving me crazy, but I know who you are. You're my salvation. You're my rock. You're the empty tomb. Therefore, I will worship you with all that I have and all that I am and all that I will ever be because you're so great, God. That should be your response. That is why I encourage you. That is putting the first things first. The first thing you are, you are a worshiper. That is what you created to do. And you're going to worship something. You get to choose what you worship. Would you rather worship the God of everything or worship his creation? Let us pray. God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you that you love us the way you have. And you've given us this, this love letter, this instructions that we are to follow before leaving earth. You have given us your Holy Spirit. You have given us the community of saints. You have given us fellowship. And we thank you for that. You're such a giving God. God, what can we give to you? And you say, I what I long from you, individual. What I long from you, family. What I long from you, church, is your worship. Like, that is what I ultimately want. I want your life to be worship unto me. That is not a moment. It is a lifestyle. That somebody can look at you and says, that is a worshiper of Jesus. And where we fall short is when people say, I didn't even know you were a Christian. I didn't even know you worship Jesus. The aura, the, the thing that I'm talking about that people, when you say, I can just see, like there's something about you. And they ask you, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? God, let that be real in our lives. Like, I, I don't want nobody to see Dion Bowling the second. I want them to see Jesus. I want them to say, ah, there's something. I knew there was something different about you. You're one of those Jesus people. I'm like, yes, you finally got it. You see it. Lord, let that be what we are. And God, let us repent when we fall short of that. 
when we fall short of that in our homes, in front of our children, when we fall short of that in front of our spouse, when we fall short of that in front of our community, when we fall short of that in front of our church, when we fall short of your glory, let us repent, let us turn away from. Let our children see us being true worshipers and not worshipers of the world. Let, us, let our children know we know more worship songs than world songs. Let our children know that we will lead them to you and not away from you. Let our spouse say, there's something different. I'm so glad to be married to this person because they are a true worshiper. Let us see them like, oh, I just love them about them. I know they love the Lord, and I can, it's written all over them. They are a worshiper. Show us where we're falling short of that, God. And God, let the songs and the praises that we sing not be gonging symbols unto you. Let them not be empty words. God, what are you saying and doing through the element of music, through the element of singing songs, through the element of singing praise? What are you saying and what are you doing? As we move into this time of worship, Lord, meet with us here. We expect it. We've prepared our hearts. If we haven't already, our hearts are prepared now. And God is saying, I'm not going to be a spectator. I'm going to participate. Even if I really can't sing, Lord, I don't want to throw anybody off. I'm going to sing like I'm singing to you. You're a great God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. And as we sing this song, church, as you prepared your heart and say, I'm worshiping God, as you prepare this song, as we sing this song, we sang it last week, we're going to sing it again, that you say how great God is how awesome he is. Let it be from your heart. Let it be from your the knowledge you know of God. And sing it. And let it live through you. Let it live through the words. We ask this in Jesus' name. And as we say, if you want prayer, if you're like, I need some, I need some prayer. Jason's back there. Elizabeth's back there. I'll be up here. My parents are in the back. Others, grab somebody next to you. Say, can you just pray for me? Can you just pray for me? Even if you come up here, I'm up here at the drum to just tap me on the shoulder. It's not important. I will pray with you. Use this opportunity to get in right place with God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.